God bless you all and welcome to Grace Point, where it's our desire for you to encounter God, serve the world, and grow in community. I'm Sasha, and I serve in the worship team here at the church. Whether you're joining us in person or online, we want to let you know that we are blessed to have you with us. At this time, I want to invite anyone who's still in the lobby to come into the sanctuary and find a seat. Service will begin shortly, but first, here's some information for you. As a church, we believe that the Bible is God's word and is the authority for life and faith. To learn all the fundamentals of what we believe, you can scan the QR code to see our full statement of faith. I also want to invite you to come out to attend our prayer meeting every Tuesday night, where we come together as a church and put on our spiritual armor and cry out to the Lord together as one body. Prayer service starts at 7 p.m. Are you new to Grace Point? Whether today is your first time joining us in person or online, or you've been here for a few weeks but haven't connected yet, text WELCOME to 845-210-9911. We also invite you to visit our Welcome Center in the lobby after service. We have a gift for you. If you don't have a church that you call home, then I want to invite you to be a part of what God is doing right here at Grace Point. Parents, if you have children aged pre-K through sixth grade, we hold a service for them in our G Kids Clubhouse. Our nursery is also open for childcare for kids three and under. To check your children in, come out to the G Kids desk in the lobby. That's all for now. Let's prepare our hearts for worship this morning. Good morning, Grace Point Church. How's everybody doing today? I said, how is everybody doing today? Praise God. It's good to be in this house. It's good to be with you guys, worshiping our God, with our brothers and sisters. I'm going to introduce my sister, Misty, who will be leading us in worship. Can we give her an encouragement, a round of applause? Misty, why don't you lead us in worship this morning? Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us pile at His feet. You conquer the grave, you free every 
Lord. We praise you because you're sovereign. And we praise you because you reign. We praise you because you rose and defeated the grave. We praise you because you're faithful. We praise you because you're true. And there's nobody greater than you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire, time after time. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. And what he did for me on Calvary is more than enough. So sing with me. Oh, I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail.
Your name 
you begin to open up your mouth and pray. Go ahead now. Why don't we just, we just lifted up the name of Jesus. We prayed this morning, said if Jesus would be lifted high, you'll draw all men to yourself. Father, we acknowledge that your name is above everything. Your name is above every name. Your word says there's no name in heaven or on earth where man must be saved. And so, Lord, we come to you now because we know that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so, Jesus, we are praying. And we thank you that you hear our cry. We thank you that you hear our voice. We thank you, God, that you are faithful, God. Lord, I pray for the person in this house, or maybe they're online, that have been praying a prayer over and over and over, and they're about to quit, but it takes one more time. It takes one more time to pray that prayer, and by faith we will pray it, even if we have a little bit of faith, but God, you will take that, and you will multiply it, and you will do what we could never do in our own strength, and you will get the glory, God. And so we love you, Lord. We love you. Can you just tell him you love him, church? Tell him you love him. Just, to, just tell him we love you, Jesus. We love you. We love you. We love you, Lord. We are grateful for you. You are our everlasting, unfailing Father. You are everything. We give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing for a moment. Before we greet one another today, we just want to acknowledge some graduates that may be in the house. If you've graduated 
eighth grade, if you're in the house, can you raise your hand? Any eighth grade graduates, high school, any high school graduates by a show of hands? No one goes to school here. Okay. <laughs> college, one person. All right. College graduates. Any college graduates in the house? Praise God. Post grad, graduate school. You're probably still sleeping if you did that. So, all right, listen, while we greet one another, those of you that have graduated, I'm going to ask you to come up to the stage. We have a gift for you. We want to pray with you. And so, why don't we greet one another, church, and go ahead and make your way up to the stage if you are a graduate. Praise God. Just a quick thought for you guys, and um, you know, the and then Pastor Edwin's going to pray for you, and then on your way down, we do have a gift. So, can we put our hands together one more time for? It's hard to graduate. It's a big accomplishment. Just want to share just a thought with you. The, the Bible tells us there's this man. He's he's really not a good man. His name's Balaam. And uh, he gets some direction from God. God tells him, don't do something. And so he says, okay, I'm not going to do this thing. But then the enemy comes back again and asks again. And so this time he says, okay, let me ask God. Maybe God will change his mind. And, and the reason I share that is because some of you are maybe going from high school to college, after college, don't know your situation. Um, and what God said in his word when you were in ninth grade is the same exact thing that he says in his word when you're a sophomore in college. And when you graduate college and go out after that, regardless of what your boss says, God's word doesn't change. So I want to encourage you that the word of God is the authority for wherever you're going next in this season, okay? Wherever you go, don't, don't worry about the pressures of your professors. Don't worry about the, prof uh, the pressure at your job or new school, whatever that may be. The word of God is the authority, and it doesn't change. Understand? Amen? Amen? Okay, come on, Pastor Edwin. Can we just spread our hands towards our graduates today and just thank God for his goodness in their lives? Can we give God a hand clap real quick? I should have told you to give a clap first, and then a hand spread, right? Yeah, God, let's give a clap first and just... We spread our heads and we bow our heads and close our eyes. Father, Lord, we just want to say thank you, God, for your faithfulness in their lives, Lord. Lord, they're graduating to different areas. Some are going to college. Others are going to high school. Father, we are thankful for what you're doing in their lives. Father, I pray that you will be with them, Lord. You will walk with them, Lord. Your word says you will, order, you will order the steps of the righteous man, God. Would you order their steps today, Lord? Would you remind them of your faithfulness in their lives when troubling times may come, Lord? I pray that you would encourage them, Lord. And Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit may go before them, Father. Father, I pray, Lord, that when they walk into school, when they walk into a job, Lord, that people will see Jesus, Father. And we thank you, Lord, that you go before us and you go before them, God. Be with them, encourage them, strengthen them, Lord, and allow them to be game changers in the, in the society, Lord. Help them to change the game, Father. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's children said, amen. God bless you guys. By the way, we have some gifts on either side. So if you go down side, we have a little gift for you guys that are graduating. So you just grab it right there to the side. God bless you guys. Here's a quick look at some of the latest happenings we have going on here at the church. To see a full list of events or to register, you can scan the QR code on the screen or the one located in your sermon note sheet at any time. Young adults aged 18 to 35, get ready for an active summer filled with get-togethers, activities, and study of God's Word. We are very excited to see the work that the Lord is doing within our young adult ministry. A few weeks ago, we had over 30 young adults show up on Friday night for dinner in the Bible. Last month, several members of the young adult ministry took the next step in their faith by being baptized. This ministry has been a tremendous blessing to my personal walk with God. A few years ago, I was going through a difficult season. 
During the 2020 pandemic, I was having trouble sleeping and experiencing nightmares when I fell asleep. At that time, I served the young adult worship team and shared with the team what I was going through. A few months later, by God's grace, Jesus delivered me from that season and I was able to sleep peacefully. Once we were able to meet in person, I shared my testimony about this during one of our worship services. A few people came to me after service to share how they were moved by my testimony, and God showed me that I went through that difficult season for a reason. To grow deeper in my relationship with God and encourage the body of Christ through my testimony. This is why gathering together is so important. We study the word, we fellowship, we share testimony, and we grow stronger in our walk. So I want to invite all the young adults to come out this Friday for potluck and Bible study here at the church in the cafe room. Make sure you bring a dish to share. With all the growth that we are seeing in this ministry, we are also looking for individuals to serve. If you have a heart to pour into the young adults in this church, then we encourage you to scan the QR code and let us know in what capacity you'd like to serve in this ministry. I mentioned earlier that several of our young adults were baptized last month. What a blessing that was to witness, but there were also many other individuals who took that next step in their faith, including five people who responded on that day to be submerged in water and publicly declared Jesus Christ as the Lord of their lives. That's why we're here, to make fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. So if you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you have not taken that next step in your faith, we have a baptism class coming up. You can scan the QR code to sign up for the class or go to the information desk in the lobby after service. That's all for now, everyone. Be blessed. Oh, praise God. I invite the ushers to come forward as we continue to worship the Lord in our giving. Just want to make a quick mention. Our cafe room next to the cafe is open. Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity for you to connect and fellowship. Whether you purchase some food at the cafe or bring your own, that's fine. But please uh, make yourself available for that as well. And just want to mention too, if you do have a, a little baby that begins to act like a baby, I um, want to let you know that we do have a nursery. And we also stream from the lobby so we can focus on the word of God in just a few minutes as Pastor Floyd will come and share the word. Different ways that you can give are located on the screens, um, and also if you're online, you can do that as well. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your provision. God, no matter what it looks like in this world, no matter what season we're going through, you are still faithful. You are great, God. I thank you that you are an unfailing Father. Lord, we ask you to take these finances, use them for your glory, God. Give us wisdom. Give us discernment how to use them, steward them for the advancement of your kingdom. We ask this in Jesus' name. Church, feel free to stand or sit as we continue to worship the Lord. But I do want to encourage you. This is a new song, but just listen to the words. Let it minister to you. The name of Jesus is the name above every name. This is the message of this song. And so whatever you're going through today, Know that you can call on Jesus and you can be saved. Amen. Isn't the name of Jesus wonderful? Isn't the name of Jesus wonderful? All the world can come to him and have their sins removed. Isn't the name of Jesus wonderful? Isn't the name of Jesus beautiful? Isn't the name of Jesus beautiful? Son of God and one of us, lover of our souls. Isn't the name of Jesus beautiful? 
the truth, the life, the only way to God is in the name of Jesus all we need. You may be seated. Isn't Jesus wonderful? He is our help, He's our strength, He's our fortress, He's everything that we have need of. Hallelujah. Well, it's my privilege to share the word of the Lord with you today. And uh, it's not necessarily <laughs> not necessarily an exciting word because the scripture that, that uh, we're at is in Genesis chapter number five and six. <clears throat> a lot of things happened in 5 and 6 that were not good. And so the title of what I'm going to share with you today is Starting Over. How many like to start over? Only a few of you. Uh, <clears throat> well, the Word of God says that all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And if that's true, then we need to start over. If we start out in sin and we're propelled and go forward in sin, there's something that needs to happen in our life, and that's being born again. And that's starting over. I remember when I was 17 years old, and I went to a church, <clears throat> and I uh, heard the gospel for the first time. Thank you. <clears throat> and I had never given my life to Christ. And so they asked at the end of the service if anybody wanted to pray. And uh, I thought, well... I don't know how to do this, but I'll go forward anyway. So I went forward and uh, knelt down by the chair, not by the altar. And as I was there, the pastor came down, put his hand on my shoulder, and he said, young man, have you ever received Christ as your Savior? And I looked up and I said, I don't think so. And so he went through Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, and shared with me how that I could confess my sin to him, and that he would come and cleanse me of my sin, and I would be born again, I would belong to Jesus, and that night, that's what I did. And my life was changed forevermore. Hallelujah. I'm getting old now, and uh, it's exciting getting old. I don't know about you, but uh, I've always looked forward to getting old. Isn't that something? Anybody else look forward to that? Got a few people that like that idea. Uh, my wife doesn't like that idea, but... Uh, I do, and so I've enjoyed getting older, and uh, I'm going to get to the one place where I'm old enough that Jesus is going to take me to heaven, and that's, that's where we're going to live forever and ever and ever. You won't get any older in heaven. I don't know what age we're going to be, but we're going to be in an amazing place. So I want to share with you today <clears throat> from Genesis in chapter 5 and chapter 6, Genesis chapter 5 and chapter 6. <clears throat> As we get into this, uh, we find here in chapter 5, and there's not a lot of things to talk about here, except there is 10 generations uh, that are involved here. <clears throat> uh, let's see here. There we go. There are 10 generations that are involved in chapter 5, <clears throat> and throughout this, it's from Adam all the way to Noah, just 10 generations. They live between 700 and 900 and some years old. How many think that would be a great idea? I don't think that's a great idea, but anyway, uh, that's how long they lived. And so there's only 10 generations that, that went from Adam all the way to Noah. In the middle of this, there is a special man. In verse number 21, it says, Enoch was his name. He lived 70, 65 years and became the father of Methuselah, who became the oldest one. Then Enoch walked with God 300 years after he became the father of Methuselah, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And then it says, Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Hallelujah. Well, that's the last we hear of him. He's in heaven with the Lord, I guess, because God took him. And that's where he would take him to be. And he's the only one that I know in Scripture 
that God just took to heaven forever without coming to a place of dying. And uh, I don't know if you're excited about that, but I, I wonder if he's going to do that again. I don't think so. But here we have a scripture that says he did. So it goes through these ten generations, and they come to the place where uh, Noah is born. And when Noah is born, things begin to change in the world. And so I've entitled this Starting Over. Starting over is a great uh, thing in our lives, especially when we are sinners and we come to know Christ as our Savior. That's the biggest start over that ever happened in my life. There's some other start overs, but uh, that's the biggest one that happened, and I trust it's the biggest one that happened in your life. If not, maybe you'll be born again today. So let's go to chapter 6. This is where we're going to deal with the first eight verses today. In chapter number 6, it says, Now it came about that when men began to multiply on the face of the land, daughters were born to them. So be things began to happen, <clears throat> and children were born. In chapter number 5, we don't hear about women at all. It's just the men, and they had children, and it goes on. When we come to chapter 6, it says that daughters were born to them. That thing begins to happen here uh, in this chapter. When the daughters were born, <clears throat> things begin to happen that were a little bit different. It goes on verse 2 and says, Then the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Here it seems like an interesting transition, because when the daughters were born, the men of God said, these people are beautiful, and so they began to take wives unto themselves, and all of the women in the place say, thank God that we, you made us all beautiful. Thank God that he made you all beautiful, because God put you in a certain place, and God has a plan for your life. <clears throat> so he makes you beautiful and says that these men of God, uh, these sons of God, were probably the sons of Adam, they saw the daughters of men, and they began to take them for their wives. <clears throat> Chose them, whoever they, they, they delighted to choose. First time when I went to India, I was a little bit surprised because I was asked to be a part of a, of a group of people. When people get married, at least back then, that was a long time ago, uh, India has changed somewhat since then. But it used to be that if you were going to get married, your parents would make the arrangements for you. I thought, that's an interesting thing, because in America, we weren't doing that. And so I listened to these parents as they came together, as they introduced their son, their daughter, to each other, and then they gave them about an hour to go find out something about the other person. Then they came back, and they decided, okay, will you marry them or not? And uh, the answer that day was, yeah, let's get married. They knew each other for an hour. Their parents made the decisions for them. How many think that's a wise idea? One, two, three, four. You know, when I saw that, I thought, wow, parents need to be more involved in who their children marry. It would help a great deal. Our society, I mean, you just go out and find somebody, and that's what we find here in this. In this. It says, and they uh, saw these beautiful girls, <clears throat> and they chose whomever they wanted. They chose whatever they wanted. And that's not necessarily the best way to do it. And that's why our divorce rate in this country is over 50%. I think it's somewhere around 60% now. Why would you get to that place? You choose somebody to live with for the rest of your life, and then all of a sudden you decide, ah, I don't think I'll live with this person. There's a problem that developed. In India, the people that I knew over there, when they got married, they stayed married for the rest of their life. Because their parents were involved in that. If you go through the scriptures, you find many parents making decisions for their, for their sons, for their daughters, as to who they would marry. And it always seemed to work out very well. And maybe we ought to go back to that. How many are in favor of doing something like that? Yeah, I don't know how many kids are raising their hand. But uh, anyway, parents need to be more involved, I think, in what's going on. And so we go to verse number three. <clears throat> Here in verse number three, it says, Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with men forever, because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. Now, before that, they were living 700, 800, 900 years. 
And God comes along and he says, okay, if this is how you're going to act, you're going to just choose whomever you want. You're just going to do whatever you want in life. I'm going to reduce your years to 120. How many are looking forward to living 120 years? All right, good group of people here. All right, our life expectancy is somewhere around 70 to 80 right now. And if you live, I know there's some people, I heard of a person just this last week, that lived to 121. And so they made it through all of those 120 years. I don't know if I'll make it that far, but I'm working on it. And uh, I used to tell my kids I'm going to live to be 120 years because I read this verse. And uh, my wife said, would you please stop telling the kids that? I said, why? Because if you die, they're going to be very upset. Well, okay, I stopped, so I don't tell anybody that anymore. But it is in the Bible. We're going to live 120 years. <clears throat> and so there's a different hap happening here. Uh, he's reduced our time tremendously uh, down to about a tenth of what it used to be. And so we go on to verse number four. And uh, here in verse number four, it says, The Nephilim, this is where we first meet them, were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, it's mentioned again in the Bible later on, the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. And I wonder who these Nephilim people are. They seem to be different. They were giants, I understand, bigger than other people. And uh, I don't know about you, but I like watching basketball. Some of those guys are really, really tall. They don't have to jump to put the ball in the basket. They're just that tall. They can just dump it in there. Anyway, I enjoy watching that. And the Nephilim seemed to be like that. Uh, and they were popular people, uh, but it doesn't say anything about their faith. It doesn't say that there was something that driving them toward God. And I've, I've enjoyed the testimonies of many sports people uh, giving thanks to Jesus for saving them. Uh, bringing Christ into their life, and they live differently, and I think that's an exciting thing. I appreciate that when they get to the point of being able to share their testimonies like that. I think it's wonderful. But the Nephilim didn't seem to get to that place. Uh, they didn't seem to do that. They didn't say that they had any faith at all. And so we come to verse number five. And verse number five is really the beginning of what I want to share with you today. In verse number five, it says, Then the Lord saw the wickedness of men, that it was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Isn't that amazing? The Lord looked down and he saw. You know, God sees everything. There isn't anything that he misses. He sees everything that happens in our life. Now, I used to think that would be an amazing thing, that God would know each one of us, and there's Thousands and thousands and hundreds of millions of people living on planet Earth. But God sees each one of us. You know that? He's an amazing God, isn't he? We're created in his likeness and image, and he looks down, and he, he sees us. And, and from time to time when he looks at us, he kind of shakes his head, I'm sure, and says, oh, no. Adam and Eve went the wrong way. <laughs> they needed to get starting over. Israel went the wrong way, they needed to start over. He looks at us, and we're born in sin, and he looks at us and said, each one of you need to start over. You need to get going again in a different way. You need to follow Jesus. You need to follow my son. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You need to read God's word. You need to, you need to come to understand who God is that made you. And in fact, he has a purpose and a plan for each one of you. Have you found that plan? I remember going through my teenage years, and we'd pray in church, and, and they would tell us, God has a plan for your life. You need to find out what that is, and then you need to surrender to him, and you need to walk in the ways that he gives to you. And, oh, I prayed, and I prayed, and, and God began to answer you, began to show me what to do. He directed me to the Bible school that I went to, and I'm so grateful that God saw everything that was going on in my life. And then we go on and it says in the same verse, it says, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of men was great on the earth and that every intent of their thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, that's a, that's a big statement. 
every intent of their heart. It was only evil continually. That means they didn't have any good days. You have any good days lately? Hopefully so. You start the day with saying, Jesus, you're the Lord. You made the heavens and the earth, and, and here I am, your son, and so I want to walk in your ways today. I want to see the things you have planned for me. Well, these people weren't doing that. They were evil continually. All of their thoughts were going in the wrong direction. I don't know about you, but the thought life of everybody is so very, very important. The way you think is very important. The way you contemplate things, the way that you come to your conclusions, very important in God. It goes on <clears throat> in this same verse, and it says there, Then the Lord saw that there was wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Every one of us have thoughts in our hearts. And you know what? God judges us more by what we think in our hearts than what we do in our actions. And that may be a new concept to you, but your heart is the most important thing to God. That's why when, it, when we often talk about becoming a Christian, we say, come and give your heart to Jesus. Because it's out of the heart that the very life flow comes from each one of us. It's in the heart that, that we are who we are. It's what's going on inside of us that's more important than anything else. And so it says here of these people that the hearts of their heart was only evil continually. Well, if that's God's perspective, if that's what he's seeing, then there needs to be a change. <clears throat> the scripture goes on and tells us, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And sometimes you ever notice that you say something that you didn't want to come out of your mouth? From time to time, oh, I didn't want to say that, didn't mean to say that. Can you, can you just erase that and bring me back and we'll have a different conversation? Husbands and wives sometimes go through this, uh, that just things come out because it's in the heart. It says, as a, man, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Proverbs chapter number 23 and verse number 7. Jesus <laughs> looked at some of the people and he says, you are just a bunch of brood of vipers. You know, Jesus was always kind, right? He's always loving, he's always caring. He says, you're nothing but snakes. That's what you are. You're, you're going the wrong direction and you're filled with all kinds of bad things on the inside and that's why everything that you do comes out wrong. And the people that he was most bothered by were the people that went to temple, were the people that were supposedly giving sacrifices, the people that were supposedly living a good life. He says, you're nothing but a whitewashed wall. It looks good on the outside, but what's on the inside is not the same. And he was talking about his own Jewish people. It seems like everybody needs to start over from time to time. And I think you need many start overs in life. They just need to come to a place of, I remember when I first gave my life to Jesus, I thought, man, my sin is forgiven, I'm good now forever, and I lived that way for about three weeks. And all of a sudden, God began to speak to me, and he said things that I wasn't prepared to hear. I still wasn't perfect. I still had made some mistakes, and I remember, oh my goodness, I was working at a grocery store at the time. Maybe I told you this before, but uh, when I would say something that I shouldn't say, I would go back and double up my fists and hit the freezer in the back room. My knuckles began to hurt because I wasn't perfect yet. And I'm still not perfect. I don't know about you, but I'm not perfect yet. I still make mistakes. I still say things that I shouldn't say. Even though I read God's word and I pray and I, I want to be what God wants me to be, there's still things that happen. As far as I know, according to God's word, until we get to heaven, none of us are going to be really perfect. <laughs> but what we need to do is do the best we can. I think that's why this one guy, Enoch, he evidently was a man that God loved with all of his heart because God took him. He says, Look, I think they were on a walk one day, and when they were out walking, God says, you know, you're closer to my house than you are to your house, so uh, you just as well come home with me. 
I, I think that's a great thing to do. Just let's just go be with God. He was a perfect man, it seems like. The rest of us, well, we have to struggle along with that. Well, anyway, the heart is deceitfully wicked, and who can really know it is what the Word of God says. So we go on to verse number 6. And there in verse number 6, it says, The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. He was grieved in his heart. Isn't that amazing? God would be grieved. God would be sorry that he had made man. There needs to come a change here, and this is one of the first biggest chains that we see here. God was going to wipe out everybody else on planet Earth, and leave Noah and his family. It's interesting that it doesn't say that Noah and his wife and his kids and their wives, they were all holy people. In fact, if you read later on, Noah makes some big mistakes, even after God saves him and brings him through the flood. But God found somebody. (laughs) He found Noah, and he was sorry that he had made all these plans, that they had grieved his heart, And so things needed to change. So let's go to verse number 7. And it says there, the Lord says, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. And so God looks down and he sees man that he's corrupted. And when God says that he is going to wipe them out, he doesn't just say man But he says all of his pets, (laughs) all of the animals, all of the things around him, almost everything that he created, he says, I'm going to destroy it all. You know, when man sins, our sin just doesn't affect ourselves. It affects people around us. It affects things around us. You ever see anybody have a nice pet dog and all of a sudden they kick him across the room? No, you've never seen that. Uh... Things happen because things happen in our lives that aren't right. I don't know if you've ever kicked your dog, but uh, some dogs need to be kicked, okay? They really do. They're they're bad dogs. Uh, They need to be tied up and put in a pen or something like that. But uh, anyway, uh, there's something that needs to happen within each one of our lives. This is the result that comes out of waywardness. God saw their wickedness. He saw how bad they were. And so he explains it here. And his heart is grieved. His heart is grieved about what's going on with them. That he grieved that he'd even made them in the first place. Wow. I trust that when God looks at us, he doesn't feel the same way. You're in church this morning. I think he's smiling in heaven. He says, they're all there now. They're listening to the word. They've worshipped me already. They're, they're planning their day, and hopefully they're planning their week to walk with me. That's what he hopes that comes out of these times together, that we prepare our hearts in him, that we see he's the one that we're living for. He's the one that we're going to serve. <clears throat> I think Jesus felt a lot of things that God felt, obviously. He felt the heaviness of our sinfulness. And as he prayed in the garden... I've often looked at these verses. He says, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. He says, I I know I'm going to die. And the reason why I'm going to die is because of the sinfulness of the people that I live with. Wow. That's an amazing statement. He goes on and says, he sweat and became like drops of blood. There as he prayed in the garden for us. As he prayed willing to give his sacrifice. There were things that are churning inside of him that, that he didn't want to do that. In fact, it says that he, he prayed three times. He said, Lord, can this cup pass from me? And at the end of that, three times, he said, nevertheless, not my will be done, but thy will be done. He knew the only hope for us sitting here today is that he would go to the cross and he would pay our penalty for us. He would go and suffer and yield his blood, offer his blood as a sacrifice for us that we could be forgiven and that we could come together like this and worship him and acknowledge him in all of our ways that he might direct our paths. 
That's what he was thinking. That's what he wanted to do. But it grieved him that he had to go through this process. <clears throat> it says in verse number 8, it says, But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Even though corruption is happening all around him, even though difficulties are happening in everybody's life, Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And I look at our nation, and when I hear the news, I don't know if you watch the news lately, but there's not much good news on the news. Tell all kinds of ugly things. People doing unbelievable things. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. I began to look at that and say, my goodness, favor is the same word that's used for what we call grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. That's what grace is. Grace comes along and redeems us. Grace comes along and forgives us. Grace comes along and, and leads us in the paths of righteousness that we didn't know before. And so that's what's happening, is that he comes to this place and he, say, he sees his, his son, Noah, and he says, Noah has found favor in my sight. You know you can't produce the favor of God in your life? No one from the beginning to the end has ever been able to produce favor of God. I know people that say, okay, I'm going to change my ways. I'm going to stop doing this. I'm going to start living righteously. I'm just going to start doing That doesn't work very well. It's only by the favor of God that we're forgiven our sins. Because he's the one that sent Jesus to die for us. It wasn't our idea. It was his idea. And so things begin to change. <clears throat> In Genesis chapter 19 and verse 19, it says, Now behold, your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have magnified your loving kindness, which you have shown me by saving my life. That was Lot. How many think Lot was a great guy? We don't often think of him as a great guy. He, he went to live with people that were terrible as people in New York City. Ever wonder how long New York City is going to last before it explodes? Well, he lived in New York City type of area, and <clears throat> God came along and said, Lot, you need to get out of here. <laughs> Sent an angel to him and says, you need to move. You need to get out of here because I've had it with these people. I'm going to destroy everything. And Lot says, okay, I'll leave. You saved my life. And so he's walking out with his wife and with his kids, and they get out of town, and, and his wife looks back to see where they had come from and see what town that she enjoyed being a part of. Ladies, don't look back. She turned to a pillar of salt. My goodness. And then you read the story that goes on after that. It's an amazing. Stories in the Bible are amazing. They're better stories than you can find on TV, let me tell you. And so Lot goes on with his two girls, and they go through the whole situation. But that's what happened to Lot. Lot was saved because of the favor of the Lord. We go a little further. We talk about Moses, Exodus 33. It says, now therefore I pray you, if I have found favor in your sight, let me know your ways that I may know you. For how then can it be known that if I have found favor in your sight, is it not by your going with us? I don't know if you remember the story, but God said to Moses, these people, I've had it with them. And so you take them and you lead them. You go ahead and I'm going to go the other direction. And Moses said, oh, that's not going to work. And here he prays. He says, Lord, if you don't go with us, we're in trouble. And he interceded for the people and he interceded to God that God would stay with them. That's an amazing prayer because God says, okay, I'll go with you. Have you ever thought that God will leave you? All you have to do is ask him and say like, like Moses did, Lord, you have to go with us. If you don't go with us, there's no way that I can de deal with these people. God, you need to be with us. I think God knew that all of the people that came out of Egypt... He was going to end up destroying every one of them except two. Isn't that amazing? 
all the people that came out of Egypt that were going into the promised land, their kids all went in, but not the people that left Egypt. And I think about that, I said, oh my goodness. God saved them? He was bringing them to the land of milk and honey? And they didn't want to follow him through the wilderness. Let me tell you, there's so many people in the Bible that they have opportunities to follow God, but they don't choose them. Lot, the one that we read about before, he left according to God's will, and God saved him and saved his two girls. Let's go on to Matthew chapter 24. It says, For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like in the days of Noah, for as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. I don't know, when I read that, I think, oh, God's not going to tell us when this is going to happen. It's all of a sudden going to come upon us. That seemed to be... I mean, he gave the direction to Noah to build the ark. How long did it take him to build it? Over a hundred years. You think God is patient? Oh, I think he is. (laughs) He's patient with his people that don't want to follow him. At the end of those 120 years, the flood came and the people didn't know it, but he wiped everybody out except Noah and his family. No one in his family found favor with God. How many want to find favor with God now this morning? That's better, but I still see a lot of hands that aren't up. If we are going to enjoy this life, it's going to be by a surrendering to God. I've got some other verses to give to you that really are challenging verses. <clears throat> Went on in that same uh, verse there and says, then there will be two men in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the, at the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. It's almost like 50%. I don't know if that's what it's going to be like, but that's what the scripture says. Go on to Luke chapter number one, <clears throat> talking about Mary. Mary, the mother of the Christ child. It says, the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. Do you think she was surprised about that angelic angelic vision? I think think she was kind of, what? He received the message. And she ended up saying, after a discussion, <laughs> after a discussion, somebody, something has to be said. She said, okay, I will do your will. I'll have this child. She was already engaged to be married to this guy. And now she's going to be with child knowing it's not going to be from this guy. It's going to be from God himself. Does that sound like a problem to you? It was a problem for him but she explained, listen, this is, this is from God. I didn't do this. Uh, and a miraculous birth came forth. And we call him named Jesus. The very son of God came in favor to this woman by the name of Mary and chose that she's going to be the mother of my son. And she followed him right up to the cross, tears streaming down her face because she saw what was happening to not only her son, but I believe that she understood this is the Christ. This is the Messiah. And I think all of the women were excited, and the men too, when he rose from the dead. He came out of the grave, and then he started appearing to people, and my goodness, things began to change there. Talk about starting over, a whole new thing began to happen. Let me take you to Jeremiah, chapter number 24. <clears throat> verse number seven. This seems to be one of the best verses in the Bible. This is God's promise. He says, I will, co- I will give them a heart to know me, for I am the Lord, and they will be my people, and I will be their God, 
or they will return to me with their whole heart. With their whole heart. Let me tell you what God is looking for us today is, is not a half-hearted commitment to Christ. Not a half-hearted commitment to live the way that he wants us to live. He's calling us to purity. He's calling us to holiness. He's calling us to, to live like Jesus and to understand the plan of God for our lives that we might walk in that plan, surrender to his plan. That's what he's calling us to do. Well, Israel had been taken captive. They were over in Babylon. Seemingly, this is a horrible thing that happened. Can I tell you that is the best thing that ever happened to Israel? They were in captivity for 70 years. Out of that, we have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're not going to bow to a king or to a law that's given. And so they didn't worship like they were supposed to. So they were thrown into the lion's den, thrown into the fire. I'm sorry, get the, my stories right. And they didn't have a singed hair on their head when they came out. God protected them. Daniel, the same kind of thing. He prayed to God when he wasn't supposed to pray to God. He was supposed to pray to this silly statue that they made. And because he did that, he was thrown into the lion's den. Something happened in captivity that caused the people to say, I'm going to live for God no matter what it costs me. Hello. Is that our resolve? Is that what we're doing? 70 years in captivity... And those people that lived through that captivity, God says, I want you to come now out of captivity and I want you to go back to Jerusalem. I want you to build it up because I'm going to send my Christ child to this place. Not all of them were moved to leave Babylon and go back to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was a mess. Jerusalem had been torn down. They had to build the walls. They had to build their homes. They had to build everything. And yet they were committed to do that. Probably the strongest people in the Old Testament were those that came out of those 70 years of captivity wanting to serve God in Jerusalem. They're building the tabernacle, looking for the coming of Christ to be among them. That's the strongest group of people I see in the Old Testament. It all started, in a sense, with Noah. <laughs> There was a starting over. There was another starting over. There was another starting over. The greatest start over, I think, happened in captivity. Some of you may feel like you're being held captive financially. Is that a problem? No, we trust in God. He's the one that supplies us. Some of you are working at a job that you really don't like, but you feel like you have to continue doing it. You feel like you're in captivity. That's okay. Be the servant of God where you are. That's what the Bible teaches us. That when we get into situations like that, we live for Jesus no matter what comes our way. Hallelujah? Or oh me? No, it's hallelujah, amen. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to live for God. There's so many tragedies in the Old Testament that we don't have time to go through them today. But the tragedies, sometimes that look like tragedies, are only good things. When you go through troubles and you go through trials, God promised that he'll be with you and he'll bring you out of those things. He'll bring you to a place where you can worship him, honor him. No matter what's going on in the world, let me tell you, I love the United States of America, but if you've ever prayed for it, you better pray for it now. I um, mean, it, it's a mess. Everything that you hear from both sides of the political realm. It doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat or Republican. This country is in a mess. And the world's in a bigger mess. We don't live for country as much as I love America. We live for God. He's called us to live for him. And in the middle of living for God, he says, you are the salt and you are the light of the world. Let me tell you, I want to build you up today. All of this sounds like horrible kind of stories. 
but it's this kind of a horrible story that we're living in. We're living in a world that really doesn't love Jesus. We're living in a world that has very little morals to go by. We're living in a world that is mostly corrupt. But the life that God has given to the body of Christ is to be a light to the whole world as to how wonderful he is. And that's how we're supposed to live. Whether you feel like you're in captivity or you feel like you're just set free to do whatever. Live for Jesus. Live for Jesus because that's what he's called us to do. Not to be content in ourselves, not to be content with what we have, not to be content with the job that we have or whatever family is going on around us. Be content with Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And if you're content with him, you're in a good, good place. Even if you get sent to jail, it's okay. Anybody else you know that went to jail that did okay? Oh, there's many stories. Oh, we could go on and on and on. Your circumstances don't really matter. Your faith in Jesus Christ is what matters the most. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've called us to be a light. You've called us to be salt in this wicked world that you called us to live in. You call us to live differently. You call us to live for your honor, for your glory, to stand up for truth, to stand up for your way. Lord, that you might be glorified not only in our lives, but in the lives of people we come into contact with. Lord God, we pray that the salt and the light would be effective here in Rockland County. Lord, it would just spread throughout the whole area that other people would come to know that there is life to be lived that's different in the life in this world. Lord, you came to forgive. You came to set free. You came to bring us into the abundance of life that you promised in Jesus Christ. Lord, we open to you. We receive life from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Let's serve the Lord with all of our hearts.
solution that comes my way. And when I cannot stand, I fall on you. Cause Jesus, you're my hope and say. So teach, so teach my soul to rise to you, Lord. When temptation comes my way. And when I can't. tell you, I have elders, we have deacons, we have deaconesses, we'll be glad to pray with you, but hear the word of the Lord, let's move into his favor, let's turn from our wickedness, let's turn to him, let's say, God, you're the very center of my life, and I want to please you with everything that I do, let's do that this morning, if you need prayer, come, we're more than willing to pray for you, God is the one that changes our lives, Father, we thank you. Lord, for your word, we thank you most of all for your Holy Spirit, for the love of Jesus that you've shed on on the cross of Calvary, that we might be delivered from ourselves, delivered from this world, delivered to your glorious kingdom. Lord, receive us as we respond to you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Let's serve him with all of our hearts.